Hello and welcome to RVA Arts Cultural Passport. I'm Chioki Ianson, Assistant Professor of African American Studies here at VCU, and also a guy that likes public radio. I am joined today by my co-host, Paige Goodpatrick. <laughs> Thank you, Gioki. That was a great introduction. And I have to say that I'm a little starstruck today to be sitting across this awesome thing right here that um, so has amazing. been created for us, especially for this evening, um, to be sitting across from you. So I'm so glad to be here. I'm blushing. And I've also <laughs> covered the microphone with my hand. How do you like that? Hi, oh we're so professional. So good at this. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, we're here today to talk about uh, two interests that we have in common, namely radio and also contemporary art. Um, it's strange, I think, to, uh, to meet someone that I didn't really know about until recently who has such a similar uh, perspective than I do, um, and I'm, I'm very keen to talk about it. And I guess we can start with your website, uh, looksee.co. Tell us about it. How, how'd you get, how did we get to here? Well, we got to here basically um, as a result of stories. So um, I started out in radio about five years ago and, and started at WRIR and didn't really know what I wanted to focus on, but just knew that I was interested in, you know, my dream was to be an NPR reporter, and here I am, sitting across from my dream. <laughs> and uh, so I really wanted to be um, Eleanor Beardsley because she's in Paris. Sorry, but you know. Oh, I know, because I want to be <laughs> Sylvia Pagoli. In Italy, yeah, yeah. yeah. yep. Um, and. When I started down this road, I thought I needed to take a writing class because I thought I needed to kind of get my writing chops up to speed. I hadn't done that in a while. So I took a creative nonfiction class. And it just, the stories that the people in this class with me had to share were just so incredible. And it changed the way that I looked at the world. I mean, literally, it changed the way that I walked through my day. I would walk down the sidewalk in Carytown or on the VCU campus and know that every single person that was passing me had some incredible story that was unheard by more than just a few people. And so that really started to shape what I started to do on the radio, on my original show, The Creative Habit. And, um, you know, at the same time, the focus of that show was creativity and innovation, and I was having a really hard time um, narrowing that down um, and covering everything that I wanted to cover. I would come away from every interview feeling like I wanted to interview five more people or ten more people that I had learned about in that interview, and that wasn't possible, partly because it was just me at a little volunteer radio station and partly because it's just not possible. So I started to narrow my focus and eventually um, began, you know, really enjoying interviewing visual artists and curators and what better place to do that than here in Richmond where we have such a wealth of, of um, creative artists in this community. And together with my partner, Caroline Wright, a couple of years ago, we started talking about joining forces. She produces the amazing videos that are on the site that are kind of visits into a, um, an artist studio and process. And uh, we created this multimedia site, Look -See, which launched in October. And so, you know, we're just, it, it is, um, I just feel like it is the most incredible gift to me to be able to go out and have conversations with these artists and curators and and hear their stories, so it's it's interesting. Um, uh, I, I hear in, in in your story the the very beginning. I think of most people who do audio, which is that they're just they just want to hear stories like straight up. So they're kind of, there's like that period where you're like this kind of like frantic hunger where you want to know what people are like and what they've done. And then there's this uh, kind of narrowing to like the kernel of the thing that you want to get and then that ends up being uh, for you um, art. 
And that's, that's interesting to me because I have a very similar interest. Like I also have a, a, a particular interest in trying to get uh, things from, from artists, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, but I guess I wanna, I, along those lines, I'm wondering who is this site for? So like you, you take the stories, right? And then yeah. you, uh, you cut them, you listen, and then you reproduce them for the public. Who is this for? Well, that's a great question. And I think the, the sort of trite but genuine, the obvious but genuine answer to that is it's for everyone. One of the things that I found when I began to, um, and this kind of dubs tales into your class on museums, Chioki. So one of the things that I found when I began to be interested in contemporary art in particular um, was that it is very intimidating even for someone like me who has two graduate degrees and you know is has been to museums and has taken art history classes and it's very intimidating to walk into a gallery to um, and I mean once you're in the door what do you do how do you engage with the work how do you figure out who the artist is if you want to have a conversation if you want to ask questions and you know so a huge part of what we want to do with Look See is break those barriers down and make that experience accessible to everyone. And part of that is I kind of think of it as throwing open the doors to um, to the galleries, to the artist studios, to give people a little bit of an idea of you know this is what goes on there. This is how you can enter into that space. Let me walk you through that. Let me go take you into this gallery. Let me take you into this conversation with this artist. Let me, you know, tell you another part of the site is that we have a, a calendar of events that is everything from what's going on at the VMFA to artist talks in this room to, um, you know, little sort of random one-off, one-night, very local events. and. That's the, you know, that's the same purpose. And then we also want to include a multitude of voices. We want to um, have, and, and we want the audience to, to sort of cross age ranges and socioeconomic lines and in Richmond, you know, geography. We who live in the city have a different um, level of comfort with, you know, traveling in the city, for example, to go to a, a gallery or whatever. Um, and of, co of course across race and gender identity lines and we want all of those people to feel like this is a place that they can begin. And then ultimately we'd like to move it into the real world as well and, um, and actually take look-see onto the sidewalk and have gallery tours and artist talks and studio visits that people can sign up for and you know actually come with us and have us sort of hold your hand and show you the way. When did you become interested in contemporary art? Like at what point in your history that were you like, you know what, that really weird sculpture has got something yeah. going. <laughs> yeah, you know that's kind of hard to pin down because I definitely was one of these people who thought I could do that. You know, why is that a big deal? Why is a, a whole painting that's nothing but white? What is the deal with that? And I think that goes back to the stories. When I started to talk to artists and um, curators and, you know, other people who worked with contemporary artists and hear their, about their processes and what they were wondering about and the questions that they were trying to work through in their work and um, and the complexity of what they're doing, like an example of, you know, of that is this piece on the, on you guys' right, um, is a quilt by Sanford Biggers, and I will just say that don't miss it. You have to go to the Visual Arts Center and see this in real life because no image does this piece justice. But part of that is that you need to know the story of of how it was created. It's an antique futon cover and you know the imagery has all of this symbolic importance. There's another piece of his that's made on an antique quilt from the United States that is um, referencing the Underground Railroad but he's painted on it. There's a 
thing that looks like a lotus flower that he's created. It's really a graphic design that repeats that iconic image that many of us have seen of the way that slave ships were laid out to maximize the number of bodies that um, slave traders could put in these ships. You know, and, and until you know these things, you walk in and you see a quilt maybe, or maybe not even. And so as I started to hear the stories of the processes and the themes and the questions that these artists were working through in their, in their work, um, as you can hear, I get really excited about it. <laughs> so. Yeah. Man, yeah, I think I feel the same way. Um, I, yeah. At the beginning, yeah. Was, yeah, was, let's let's get through this. Yeah, let's get through this damn thing. Um, <laughs> so uh, I would say that at the at the at the very beginning, I was hyper antagonistic to contemporary art. Like it didn't just seem, you know, like you know, bad art to me. It seemed straight up stupid, right? So I was in that I was in that like large group of people in, in the public who were just like, it's a brick, you know what I mean? Right. Like, who cares, you know, who cares? It's a brick, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it, it wasn't until I would say I got to graduate school and took like a course in aesthetics that I began to be receptive to this idea that not only is this weird brick art, it's also something so much more clever than the old stuff that we got into, right? Like mm -hmm. in, the, in the beginning, we're, we're taught that, um, the great old dead white guys are the only people who can produce art, right? And, that, and everything else is a craft and et cetera. And the old dead white guys made these portraits and there's Napoleon and there's like the Mona Lisa and is she smiling? Oh my goodness, Da Vinci Code, right? And so, <laughs> and, um, and so, so that seems like the simple thing. Like it's, it's purely mimetic. It can, you know, like it's, it's skillful because you can see that it took a lot of training to do it. And so therefore it's like, it's super dope. And that's the stuff that's art. And this other weird blob on a canvas isn't art. And who cares? And it's just a trick that you know rich people are doing to you know fool everybody into thinking that this is worth something, et cetera, et cetera. I was totally, I was totally in with that whole party. Um, and then uh, after studying some aesthetics, I, I saw the conceptual breaks that make certain types of art possible. And these things, to me, were very similar to the conceptual breaks that make certain kinds of philosophy possible, because I'm a philosopher, and that's mm -hmm. how I think about the world. you know. Um, so that once I started to get that, oh, this is the ancient period, and this is the modern period, and this is the, right, and this is the, the contemporary stuff, and, and once I saw the types of ideas that become possible in each epoch, then suddenly, contemporary art was not only interesting to me, it was the most interesting thing that could possibly exist, right? And like, and so then, and so, you know, once I think you are turned on to the conceptual reality of contemporary art, Mona Lisa is just boring. Mm -hmm. Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa's boring, you guys. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, great, it's like a kid. I mean, it was dope for its time, obviously, right. because, in, you know, if we're talking about the Renaissance era or whatever, like, these cats are making it possible for someone who draws to be an artist in the European framework. Yeah, sure, that's awesome. But, like, how long are you going to have me stare at this thing in the Louvre? You right. know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. let's, can we move on? Like, let's talk about the thing that has the richer conceptual framework. And that's all the stuff that's in, in the contemporary art. That's the stuff in the special, you know, the special ex exhibition at uh, the MFA, the totality of the ICA is gonna be that party, mm -hmm. right? Anyway, so when I got to VCU and I learned about this ICA thing, I started talking to the ICA people and I, and I shared with them my, my, you know, my transition. And I thought, hey, wouldn't it be great if I could help people do the same jam? And so together with them, we created uh, this online course, mm -hmm. like a 15-hour course in which I hope, you know, we, we could help guide people who had the same attitude that I had into seeing that, that contemporary art was something that was pretty, that was actually pretty fresh, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, um, I love the way that you started this, this course out. And if you guys haven't checked it out, is it still online? It's still online. It's, uh, it's, it is, it's very much beta. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah. But it's still, it has, you know, I love the way that you began with this idea of satire and that the that contemporary art 
in some ways has a it has a it's a symbol it's a thing that is used um, culturally to represent a certain other thing which is this idea that um, contemporary art is for wealthy snobby people and they like that you don't understand because yeah. that makes them feel like well, we get it and you don't and it's supposed to be that way and so there are all these great examples that Chioki, um come you know points out of ways in which contemporary art has been used that way and um, so one question that I always ask is uh, to people you know curators and artists and other people who are sort of um, immersed in the art world is this idea of you know do you like going to a museum or a gallery or whatever and having the information presented to you so there is this debate among curators about you know do you go and just experience it and it just washes over you and the way I always felt when someone explained it to me that way is that if I didn't get it when I stood there and let it wash over me that I was a dummy you know and that um, but some people really do prefer that and um, and then there's the whole other end of the spectrum where you have, you know, a ton of wall text that explains to you, you know, what is the concept behind this. And I think this is a great, I think that's a great uh, paradigm to, uh, to have an explainer or to not have an explainer, mm -hmm. to take the playbill or to not take the playbill. All right, show of hands, everybody. How many of you walking into a museum you want to have like the little placard that explains to you a good chunk of what the art is about or how it was made. Raise your hands. How many of you would not like that? Suckers. You're all a bunch <laughs> of suckers. Okay, now, um, so let me let me tell you why I'm uh, I'm pro I'm pro playbill pro placard right. Uh, context is how you survive living. Like that's like context is how you survive. Like that's how you make it to the next day. Um, and for a lot of, and you, you know, many of you, I saw this sucker raise his hand, many of you have an encyclopedic knowledge of art, and so therefore you're already carrying that context with you. But for those of you who are not, like, you know, I know it's difficult, it's, it's hard to accept, and I think it was hard for me to accept sometimes, understanding can be just as much of a precursor to beauty as being confronted by it. Addendum, beauty isn't the goal of all art, right? And so, uh, so for me, the, the more that I know about something, then uh, the, the closer that I might be able to get to coming to an understanding of what, what the ideas are, I think, that are most operative, let's say, in the piece. And those are the things that I'm going to think are, are pretty dope. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's always a great exercise uh, to, to be like, yo, no, no, no play bill for me. I'm not going to look at that right now it's a great exercise because you can be like you can what's the whole thing where you like there's a whole thing like a whole technique yeah right where you like mm -hmm. sit and then you you look at it and you for, see a, certain it's like, for a certain amount of time for a certain amount of time and then you ask a question you know like mm -hmm. i think that's dope but don't have that be your only jam mm -hmm. like do that and then like get some context and expand your understanding to the point where then you'll be able to be like actually i can tell you all about you know etc <laughs> right well, and, and I also think that, um, that withholding that information is intentionally or not. I don't believe that it's currently intentional. But at, at one point, I think it was. It's a way of, um, it's a way of maintaining class. And, you know, for example, one of the museums that I love and hate the most is the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. And you know, this woman, wealthy woman, built a museum for her friends, really, to come to and see her incredible collection of art that spans every era that she was alive for, you know, from antiquity to the Impressionists. There's not one identifier or word or anything anywhere in this museum. You carry around these big, thick pieces of plastic and match them to the wall and even then it just tells you you know who did it and what it is made of right. essentially and it was done at a time when the people who were coming to her essentially invitation only museum 
were people who had taken art history classes and had done the great tour in Europe and had seen, you know, they had an education that taught them about um, Leonardo da Vinci or, you know, the other great Renaissance painters or even the Greek sculptures and things like that. And, and so to me, it always feels a little bit classist to assume that, I mean, there are some pieces of art that when I, I see them, I have an instant response to them. But that's not to say that your response isn't deepened by then later knowing, you know, what was this artist thinking about when they were making this piece? How did they make it even? Jackson Pollock is a great example of someone that I, you know, when you right. see how he made like his the paintings. the methodology is yeah. actually part of the contemplation mm -hmm. of the, right, yeah. Man. So. Yeah, no, you raise a good point about the political significance of having this information, mm -hmm. right? Like, it, even if you're a cat who doesn't, maybe you don't want it, if it's not there, then that art space is actually making a claim about who it sees as being worthy of contemplating the art. Mm -hmm. Ooh, let that be a lesson, <laughs> you future museum people. Um, yeah, that's super dope. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's let's right, fly let's through. See, let's see what's Yeah, next. we don't get through these slides a bit quicker okay. than we're gonna like. All right, so when I all right, so when I saw this, who who knows? Let's do another hand raising thing. Who knows who painted that painting right there? Oh, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, very good. So this is a painting by, yes, it says there right there, um, an artist, Candy Wiley, who is one of the superstars in the art world right now. And this superstar interviewed him when he was here in Richmond for yeah, his exhibition. Send those requests in, you never know. He, yeah. yes, and so um, it was just, you know, kind of this collision of, of uh, starstruckness for me to hear that interview. Um, and it was a good one, Chioki. And, um, I was so nervous, like, talking to this <laughs> dude. Because it was like in the, so like, imagine, imagine, if you will, the setting. It was in the VMFA, and we were sitting in front of one of his paintings, which are like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, you know, and like, if it was to go on sale, it'd be like $400,000, you know what I'm saying? So we're like sitting in front of this huge, humongous painting, and his handlers are all like on the wall, and there's like eight of them with like clipboards, like looking mm -hmm. at me or whatever, and I'm just like. With a timer. Yeah, with a, oh, yeah. Yeah, with a timer. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna ask questions to Mr. Y now. Yeah, it was, mm -hmm. it was weird. Um, yeah, okay, so what I'll say about this, I don't have like audio to play or anything, but what I'll say about this is that the thing that I have been wondering the most about uh, about his artwork in particular is that like it's it's obviously it's making a statement we can talk about it later but but I want I was wondering because it's a, it's a kind of criticism of the old masters remember the old dead white guys of, of European painting that I was talking about so this is a kind of criticism of those cats so I was like I said, hey man and I said it in like and I, I was saying it in a way that was more eloquent than I'm about to say it now um, I was like yo dog uh, like you were, you're up in here with these super rich people. Obviously, it's mad white people up in the space. Um, you know, do people look at your art and like think, you know, more deeply about like the racist elements of the, you know, the art world, et cetera, et cetera? He was like, no. Yeah, he answered that pretty clearly. He just said no. I was like, you know what? You're okay with me, man. Mm -hmm. You're okay with me. Uh, I, I thought it was interesting too that he said. Um, he said that often his paintings are the only black person in the room, in the places where, in the spaces where they live. But this is another example of if you know, the more information you have, the more you understand what he was trying to say, is trying to say with his work. A new thing that I learned from your listening to your interview with him was that his painting, so he started out painting people and men, African American men in New York, and he would just get them off the street and get them to pose. He would actually give them these books of old masters and they would choose which one they liked the best and kind of wanted to see themselves in. And he would paint them in those settings. And um, then he's gone all around the world to do various versions of this and he did a version of it in Nigeria and I did not know that he had used these massive um, Nigerian monuments 
as the models for the ways in which the men, and I think it was just men, he paints mostly men, um, had posed. And so knowing that and knowing everything that I just said is just a beginning, an entry point into Kehinde Wiley's work. And, um, and then there's all kinds of other great stuff he said in that, in that know, interview I mean, yeah, about, you like, know, the capitalism and, and creating um, luxury look, goods. He was and, kind of writing out. And, and, yeah. and I would say he was writing out to the point where they were all like, hey, we're, we're, it's time. Like they were like, like hey, maybe, maybe let's stop right. this jam. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's not say anything that'll make, make anybody mad that yeah, buys yeah. your paintings. All right, let's, so, let's, let's hear your interview. We, yeah. you, have a, you have a clip, right? So I have a clip, and I hope it will play. Is John, is that? Um, so you, got, you, got, you, got, you got a click, double click. Yeah. Open, a, Ooh, open wait a the jam. I am a believer that once the work leaves your studio, there's no control. You lose total control. So I try to live with the idea that it's part of, you know, letting go. In some ways, it's like sons and daughters. There's a point that you have to, you know, let them be and they have to grow. Then I think you missed up a big one there. So I, for me, my philosophy, or at least the thing that I drives my decisions is that I have to understand that, that it, it's not up to me anymore once the work leaves my studio. That is exactly what I think what happened to Rothko. And I wholeheartedly feel for him because I know what he's talking about, but I don't think it's, that's the place where you need to necessarily end. So, first of all, is that a great radio voice? That is an amazing voice. So I went to the, fir the, f the only radio workshop that I ever did. That's the other thing, though, about uh, radio. It's a dope medium, and I think we'll talk about the mm -hmm. medium of radio in a minute, but it requires you to have good talkers. Yeah, right? it definitely yeah. does. And sometimes that's hard with visual artists because sometimes Woo! they are not comfortable <laughs> talking. That's why they're visual artists. But, um, but anyway, Javier Tapier, who is an incredible artist who teaches at VCU and has been here a painting here in Richmond for many, many years, is, has a great radio voice. I think we can all agree. Um, but that was the first, that was one of the very first uh, shows that I produced for The Creative Habit, and it was actually a show about a play that is about Mark Rothko. And Javier had been brought in as a consultant to teach the actors how to act like real artists. And so he taught them how to put paint on the canvas. There's another great clip that you know where he's talking about how teaching them how to move around the canvas and you know uh and he that, taught them the performativity of creation you know? yeah and how to stretch the canvas and all of these things that if you were going to play an artist on the stage you needed to know um and that was the first show that i produced where i really felt like i was getting to that thing i talked about at the beginning the story and it was javier who brought that story element. It wasn't just an interview. It wasn't just a, you know, a piece of news about a play, but it was a story of Javier's philosophy. Yeah, I mean, you also highlight the importance of like, I guess, leaving the tape running, you know? Because mm -hmm. that was pretty fresh. I don't really know at what point, like in the conversation, you know, that it happened, but I've often noticed that you will think you'll be like wrapping up the interview and then they'll be like, and also a whole bunch of other just knowledge bombs. And then, it, and yeah, and I've made that mistake in, in the past where I've been like, okay, and I'm packing up. I don't pack up at all ever now. I say, I say thanks for the interview and I, I'm still recording. You know what I mean? Yeah, I made that mistake yesterday, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I interviewed an artist who was super shy and it was really hard to get him going. And as soon as I started packing up, he started saying all kinds of great stuff, and it's just gone. But I, they're they're <laughs> the worst. The, the, the shy the shy ones are the straight up worst. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's hard. Yeah. Now that's so, fresh though. I love yeah. I love this. No, well, it's the, the idea of this. You know, letting a thing go, like you make a thing and then it goes away. Um, uh, that is, it leaves your control. 
that is something that I think is becoming more and more relevant, not just for artists, but for all human beings who have an online presence. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think that there's a certain kind of uh, reckoning that we all are going to have to do one day with our uh, Facebook accounts that <laughs> it's coming soon, you guys. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. What, what, else, so, what else we got yep. in this jam? Oh, Ooh. I think we moved. We, we moved. have more clips. Yeah, we moved slides around. So. So this was another, so in the beginning, I wasn't just focused on visual arts. And one thing that just really blows my mind is how choreographers work. How do you create something that exists in your head and then your only way of bringing it out into the world is getting other people to move their bodies the way that you see in your head. How do you, how do you communicate that? And um, so Kate Skarpatowska uh, tells us how. Um, Kate Skarpatowska, and I'm from Warsaw, Poland originally. I live in New York City right now. My process is always the same, and it always starts with the music. I really try to connect to the music, and if I start to see pictures, I know that the music is right to use for this particular occasion. So I listen, listen, and more images start to sort of become alive in my imagination. Coming into the studio, I basically have a structure already, an arc of the piece created in my head. I actually think that uh, painting is very closely connected to dancing, especially if you work with images within your head connected to the music and you sort of feel like you have an arc of the dance or almost like an outline or a sketch of the dance, just the same way that you know Van Gogh would you know sketch first and then apply the colors later. And those colors to me are the dancers coming into the studio. And once I sort of try to fill in and color within those lines. I do it with them collaboratively, but I have my design in the back of my mind. That's sort of been my process always, and it seems to some something that I'm connected to very strongly. Yeah. Whoa. I've never heard it explained like that. Like I'm a super fan of um, of dance. I, I I roll I roll with dancers quite hard. They're super awesome people. Um, uh, and I've seen the choreography process, but I've never, no one's ever explained like what it's, what a dance is like in the mind of a choreographer before they set it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's fresh. And it just, you know, I mean, that's another example to me of, of what I'm trying to do with, with Look See and with my work more broadly is just, you know, bring those stories out for us to hear and, you know, whether it enriches or changes your experience of, of that dance or that painting or whatever, maybe every single one doesn't, but it, it definitely, it, for me, it just enhances the humanity. Yeah. And it just, it, I'm in awe. Yeah, choreography is like, uh, I guess it's like this stagecraft drama stuff in that it, it has to move through space as well as time. You know what I mean? And then the other weird thing is that it like it it has to depend on somebody else's like physicality um, mm -hmm. or somebody else's ability to move or to say something or however it goes. And so mm -hmm. like it said once it's a it's a more if you if if we're thinking about like painting as being a baseline, it's a more imperfect framework because you're not in control of like what the oil, mm -hmm. you know, the, like you're in so much control in the painting framework, but you have to there has to be a certain kind of creative collaboration on the body of any given performer. Mm -hmm. And so the best thing you can that you can the best thing you can do is choose your performers wisely. You know what I mean? Yeah. Trust. Huge part of it. Yeah. That's dope. So Okay, so you don't you don't actually don't have to click on this like I, you, just in the right. in terms on the right. subject of history of uh, stories or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a thing uh, that I did a while back when I lived in Brooklyn, um, there was a black association that wanted to go around and kind of interview the elder people in the community, you know? Um, and, and so I did this, and the thing that was dope about it is that I learned so much about Brooklyn just by talking to these people that I would normally never talk to. And I think that's the, this is the thing that, that we have in common about narratives, is that like, if you holler at somebody that you wouldn't normally talk to, chances are you're gonna learn something that's like 
pretty dope or like pretty amazing. Um, and, and that happened a lot. Like I interviewed a, a lot of uh, like older cats and learned about like their migration from like the Caribbean up to New York back in the day. I learned about what, what Brooklyn was like when all Germans lived in Brooklyn, you know what I mean? Um, and I talked to this one dude who was a Tuskegee Airman, you know? Um, and so this is, in the, this is on the topic of like stories that like otherwise you would never have heard this. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? So like, and, and this is a guy that, that, is, that has now passed on. So like it's, you, I recorded something for a lot of people, and just, like I've, I've done a lot of recordings where people have since died, and then the family is like, can we have this, you know, like it's the last like testament of them, you know? Um, so here's a story that like wasn't told until like I put this microphone on this dude, and then he like told it to me. So he was, uh, so he was a Tuskegee Airman, um, and he, you know, uh, so the first thing that was crazy is that like he, had, he, he lived in New York, and then he, he had to go down to Tuskegee to start the Airman program, and so like he's on the train and uh, they, they, he doesn't know this because he's not, he's not hip exactly how the South works. Like, so the, the train passes the Mason Dixon line and he's in the dining car with like his, 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 uh, his black en enlisted people and they pull a curtain over the dining, like his section of the dining car. And he's like, hell is this? You know what I mean? And they're like, yo, like we're, act we're separate. Like you can't actually, you know, and he didn't, like, he had the full realization of what it was, like, there on the train. And he, like, put his head down and cried or whatever. And at that moment, he was like, I'm not actually doing this for my country anymore because, obviously, my country's got problems. I'm just doing it for me. So that was fresh. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then he was uh, training, and they do the airplane. This is how versed I am in military uh, aero, you know. They do the airplane thing. <laughs> So he was getting, uh, so he was doing, getting his hours in, unlike the, unlike the, the fighter thing. Okay, so he's just up in the air doing loop de loops. Or I don't know, I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> okay, fine. So he's in like a plane that has like, you know how they has like there was a, a two, two cock, a two cockpit thing. So it was like a person could sit in the front and back. Okay, so he was just in the plane alone. But like the, the, you know, like breaker breaker one nine, like the, the cable. He did a maneuver and the cable did this and looped around the flight stick in the, in the back where he couldn't reach it. And so, the, and then it yoked the plane to where the plane suddenly went like upside down and the plane stalled out. So then he said he was falling out of the sky like a dry leaf. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So then it's like more dramatic. I'm like, it's hilarious because I'm reporting it back to you, but he was telling me the story and I was like, oh, like, you know, okay, so. <laughs> So, so he's like, mayday, mayday, right? Um, and, and everybody's like, you know, yo, what's happening? He's like, yo, my plane stalled out, et cetera. And they're like, well, eject then, right? Okay. So then he, so then he, he starts thinking, and he's like, okay, I have the throttle. I have, like, these other controls that I can do. I can do the little, some other weird stuff that planes do. Um, and, and using everything but the flight stick, which he can't use, he manages to get the plane upright, start the engine back, and take it in for a landing, right? Wow. He, so he lands the plane, and you know, whenever there's a mayday goes out on a base, everybody's on deck. Like, everybody's up, and they're out, and they're like, oh, what's about to happen, right? So he lands the plane, and the whole, the whole everybody is there, right? All the base is there. And, uh, and they get the story from him, and they're like, oh, we would have all just ejected, you know? <laughs> and so then I asked him, I was like, yo, why didn't you eject, you know? And he said, I am never gonna forget this. He said, two things go together, ignorance and fear. And if you know what your plane does, if you know your machine, if you have the knowledge, then you don't have to be overtaken with fear whenever something goes wrong or whatever. What? Wow. What? <laughs> and that's why you should just talk to old people with the microphone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Everybody has a story. And um, I love the I love the the two things together the Kehinde Wiley and the philosophy professor and these you know folks that live in the apartments right next to you and have an incredible story but aren't known by anybody other than, you know known by the public. Right. And yeah. the idea that, you know, they still, they sometimes have the best stories. 
like the life of a random old person could be a movie. Mm-hmm. You, know what yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, if it was a movie, you'd be like, yo, two tickets. I'm watching. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. of a random, like a random cat. This is, this is why it's like, it's being open to the world is so important. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Because, like, we spend a lot of time um, being narrow in our focus to our, like, ourselves and our immediate whatever. And we, have, we miss a lot of things that could, like, enrich us and everybody else, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this is also. Oh, this crap. Is... Yeah. Oh, th- uh, this is just like, so we're, this is broadly on the theme of radio history like our radio interests. I used to work for this uh, uh, radio show called Backstory with the American History Guys. Um, and it was there that I got to merge, for the first time really, like the full force of my academic stuff with like radio stuff. It was mm-hmm. literally a show that was hosted by like history professors. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like how, what? well now there's a lot of them, oddly enough, but like back in the day there, were, there weren't that many. Um, and so I was able to like, do that thing that journalists love and that I always tell my students to do, which is like, when you don't know something, just call the cat who's the author of the book. Right. I promise they want to talk to you. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, if you call somebody, say, hey, can we talk about your book? They'll be like, yes, when? You know what I'm saying? Like, (laughs) that's their whole thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So for, I did a lot of, um, a lot of interviews and I have a few like pieces or whatever that, uh, that I, that I voiced, but this was like a, you know, formative radio experience mm-hmm. or whatever. And I should say also, so, you know, you're, uh, you were at WRIR, which is a community radio station. Uh, community radio is the greatest, it's the greatest mm-hmm. thing in the world uh, because they're always star for volunteers, which means you can always get in and do some mm-hmm. work. And it's like, it's the place where most people get their first radio experience, you know, yeah. um, uh, even after like doing some college radio, you, my, my own radio stuff didn't come alive until I went to the community radio station, um, uh, down in Tampa mm-hmm. and they were like, Oh, you want to do something right this way? Here's, <laughs> here's like the, all of our equipment, like here's all mm-hmm. of our resources, you know? Um, yeah. and so I, I think that I, I continue to be like an advocate for people to go mm-hmm. to the local community radio station so that they can just start doing literally anything like it's the it's the it's the I think the very often this the starting point for most people's um, interest in radio you know and it should uh, continue forever you know I completely agree they let me you know they put me on the air when I didn't have any idea what I was doing they just I had no right no experience <laughs> you know in radio at all and somebody was there to sort of show me what button to push and all that kind of stuff. But I just, you know, it was nothing, there was no better way to learn than learning by doing. And that was, you know, that was what I did at WRIR. So I'm a huge fan too. And so, you know, I'm not going to play another audio clip because we're running short on time, but this piece was, um, was another piece that was kind of formative in my development as, you know, in, in my sort of developing an interest in the visual arts. And the, again, this kind of goes back to that same idea of knowing what is going on with an artist's work and with a piece of art and how that changes the way you look at it. So this is a Susie Gage, some of you may know, or, you know, she teaches here at VCU too. Everybody who is anybody teaches at VCU. She's there's currently like, There's the, a lot of dope artists here. Oh my gosh. They're like, amazing. they're in the crowd. You know what I'm saying? It's incredible. Like, it's weird. It's yeah. weird. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. So, you know, so her work, she was a jewelry maker and now she makes these big sculptural pieces. And this piece, is like she used the same engineering concepts as engineers use to build bridges to get the piece to hold together and you know you walk into a gallery and you see a piece and you're like you know what is that you know what is it it's just such a superficial experience until you get this information and um, and then it changes the way you look at it it changes your respect for artists to feel like, you know, this person is in their studio building a suspension bridge with all these tiny little pieces of wire and recycled Starbucks cups. So, you know, that was just another sort of brick in my my uh, house of awe for artists and 
So that's what that piece is about. Oh, yeah. Look, I, we do a lot of work in radio stuff. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Uh, Unmonumental is dope. Um, you can find it on WBTF.org. Kelly Libby is an amazing radio producer who does awesome stuff. Uh, you should check her out. Uh, Unmon Unmonumental itself is, a, is a, a project that really is about interviewing people in, um, in Richmond about the things that they think of as being like important and you know worthwhile. It's, it's, it's super dope. Listen to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. This guy. This guy, yeah. I, I really do have to play this. Yeah, this, this guy is super cool. Y'all know Michael? Michael, is, he's one of my favorite cats. Okay, yeah. So he's the chief curator at the BMFA. And, you know, you look at his picture. He's got a suit to tie on. He's, you know, he's got a lot of really cool stuff to say. You know, when I show up at a museum, there's probably going to be some sort of Duchamp component that I'll bring. What can I say? He's the most radical and influential artist of the 20th century. Probably of all the artists of the 20th century, he probably thought the deepest about museums. So my desire has always been to build a Duchampian museum. And it is a museum very much like our one, a museum that is for art and for artists, but also for the community. For him, it was the viewer that was really the artist who completed the creative act with their interpretation. And that's very inspirational in itself. I would say that it was Duchamp that, it was Duchamp that made, uh, that was, he was the focal point where my perception turned, right? Right. So I went from thinking, a urinal, this is the stupidest, <laughs> to thinking, a urinal, that's the most brilliant, oh snap, you know, like that, he was the, he was definitely the, 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 the pivot point for me. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's probably true for a lot of people who are into, cre into contemporary art. Um, but who knew that we have a Duchampian museum right here in Richmond and, um, and an expert on Duchamp. So my dream is to interview Michael on Duchamp oh, and yeah. get him to really just dig in deep. I would like to be there for that. Yeah, well, we could do it together. <laughs> you heard it here first. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you guys will open the, your, your open RVRs next year with Michael. With, okay. Both of you, and we'll have a third mic. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah. It'll be green. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That would be awesome. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm so I'm so down. For, like I am so down for that. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. So this is what I'm. So this is um, your podcast. Is it has it been picked up yet, or are you pr currently producing, or where where is so where does that stand? So what had happened was. <laughs> um, uh, okay. So uh, for those who don't know. Uh, do Over is a, uh, a, a podcast uh, that, I, that we made a pilot for, uh, me, Kelly Jones, and Claire Tayson. And it was part of a, it, it came out of a, work, a story workshop that we went to at NPR. So it, in the very beginning, uh, I, I, was, I ran into Kelly, who used to work at Backstory, and she was like, hey, I have an idea for a podcast. And I was like, yeah, great. Like, maybe let's do it sometime. I have to go live my life in the meanwhile. And, um, and so then she sent out these applications to NPR and to, uh, uh, to, to PRX's um, Radiotopia. And one day she called me and she was like, our podcast got accepted. And I was like, to what? And she was like, oh, the Radiotopia pod quest. We're in the top 10. You know what I mean? And I was so like, cool. what? She was like, oh, yeah, out of, out of 1,500 applications, they picked ours and like nine others. And I was like, what? You know. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, so we did like a, a, a mini type of thing for that, but we ultimately did not get into, to be a finalist. Okay, great. But then also, she applied for an NPR Story Lab workshop, and we got into that. And then we went to NPR to like this magical, mystical place or whatever that <laughs> we've been dreaming about our whole lives. Um, and we met all the radio people, and we learned a lot of stuff. And then after that, they called us and were like, make a pilot. Like, make a pilot. Here's like some money, make a pilot. 
So that's what we did. Um, and it was fun and it was like fantastical. And then they went and they put it through like the testing process. They have very complicated analytics at NPR. Um, and ultimately they decided not to uh, pick up and run with our podcast, which if we explained it to you, you'd probably understand why a news organization wouldn't pick up a podcast about people who were literally imagining what your life would be like if you had made a different choice that one time. Yeah. So, yeah, we made a pilot about yeah. a lady who was a psychology uh, professor, but who always wanted to work at Waffle House. And, <laughs> and, we, and we totally made up what her life would have been like and then and, and played it like it was a straight, you know, story. Okay. So yeah, NPR didn't really want to make that into a show. Uh, Love it. It's kind of like, um, you know, it's, it's like radio theater. So yeah, the part so about was, kind yeah. of imagining what her life would be like. Yeah, it was like part investigation and part of that. We didn't straight up make it up, right? Like we went to Waffle House headquarters and interviewed, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, side note, there's a Waffle House museum. Okay. Wow. So, and no, it's legit. Oh, no, no, what's the other thing? Um, the, the people uh, kind of informally have a, a Waffle House index. So what it means is if there is a natural disaster, um, then yeah, like the, the weather advisory is one thing, but the real test of how bad the natural disaster is is whether the Waffle House is open. Right. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. That's where people they, meet who don't have electricity. They, yeah, they have a disaster menu mm -hmm. where like all the things you can get when there's no electricity. Mm -hmm. Oddly, you can't get waffles when there's no electricity. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so fine. So they didn't um, pick up our pie. We, you can still go and listen to it do over podcasts, whatever, whatever. Um, what they did do was give me and Kelly jobs. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I figure that probably it's fine, you know? Yeah. Um, That's uh, where you were discovered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both Kelly and I got our, like, first connections there. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, she now works uh, at NPR as a, um, a, a producer of brand Soundscape, which is, like, a weird job that only she has, you know? Um, and then I'm, like, the underwriting guy, mm -hmm. uh, which is also very weird. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. So my question after looking, listening to that pilot is, do you have a do-ever? Do you have oh. a point where you, I mean, we all do, but. I, for, I forget, you know, we all had a, um, oh, okay. So it, we had like a, we mapped out what our other shows would be. And so both Kelly and I uh, were pretty sure that if we had made one different choice, like over here, like some point in our lives, we would be like in Hollywood being stunt doubles for kung fu action movies. <laughs> okay, so where, where, where would that have happened for you? Okay, so in college, I made a choice to pursue, you know how like when you're in college, you're doing all the stuff, and I, I, was, a, I was deep in the kung fu school, and I was also doing all my time in radio, right? Mm -hmm. And so at one point in college, I chose radio over Kung Fu, right? Um, and so if I had chosen Kung Fu, probably, probably I'd be in Fast and Furious right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's fun uh, to think about that kind of stuff. It's the literal opposite of what the psychologist told us to do. Just side note, this, isn't, <laughs> this is not healthy. You're not yeah. supposed to do this. All right, so we're running out of time, so I have one very important question that I have to get in before okay. we end. All right. So um, you all may have heard that Chioki's main job is as a professor and his, um, or I don't know whether this is your main job. Yeah, professor. One of your jobs is as a professor here at VCU, and, and he studied philosophy. And so I, I want to know, and you also love motorcycles. Oh, yeah. Which hasn't come up yet, but we do have a slide Oh, my God. That. Let's, Let's just see go if we can find the slide. We'll, we'll, yeah, stuff, yeah. cool stuff. Yeah. Stuff, stuff, so, stuff. So you, <laughs> so you have said that you can explain how German philosophy shreds yeah. the idea that riding without a helmet represents personal freedom. So come I on. I said that once. Give yeah. it to us <laughs> in, in one minute. Okay. Um, so a lot of people out here uh, who live in like non-helmet law states 
believe falsely that if they ride their motorcycle and they don't wear a helmet, then that is them exercising their freedom in much the same way that they don't want the nanny state telling them to put on a seatbelt and that kind of thing. So they, so their fundamental uh, like uh, belief is that like the particular modality in which they ride a motorcycle that is without a helmet is one that uh, that fulfills their conception of them actualizing themselves as free agents. Are we good so far? Everybody, mm -hmm. everybody good with that? Okay. Now. In order for that to be true, they would have to also believe that the thing that makes one free is uh, acting in a way that also isn't safe, right? Mm -hmm. And there, there isn't, there's no fundamental connection uh, between those two things. Do, do, you, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so like the thing that they're, um, that they're reacting against is the fact that somebody else uh, produced a requirement for them and that they have to uh, follow the requirement. And it's the production of requirements that that by itself is the thing that they're rebelling against. And in their rebelling against a the requirement, they believe that that means that they're free, right? When actually it's completely possible that they could have a thing be required. However, they could elect to do it even though, even though the requirement exists, right? So that the fact of a requirement doesn't change the fact that there's also an election process. And the election process, that is the choice to wear a helmet, is, not, is a free choice. <laughs> so they're dumb. It's what I, if you don't wear a helmet, you're dumb, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for you. Okay. Um, you're, you're out here interviewing artists. Uh, who is the artist that you want the most to get an interview with? Mm, um, well, I have a whole bunch, but right now, top of mind is Elizabeth King. And I could just call her and ask her, and she probably would say yes. But I haven't yet. Part two of the Michael uh, Taylor interview, um, Elizabeth Kane, right here. OK. okay. <laughs> you guys need your own class. I know. I know. <laughs> yep, we'll just interview artists. We, well, it we would could, be so fun. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, we should talk. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a thing that we, this is something that we could do. And if you guys haven't checked out Liz King's work, you can find it on YouTube. Google Elizabeth King, VCU. She's a VCU <laughs> teacher. This school. And uh, your mind will be blown. I guarantee it. So anyway, I think we're out of time. Are we? We, we do have a little time for questions. If you guys, okay. can, if you guys can set aside a little bit of time for questions. Let's I do know it. What sure. What the dance card is like, but. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Because these guys have, our, at least the students in our class have prepared a bunch of questions that have to do with the research. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. Ah. <laughs> so, we've required them to, to do three questions, um, and they're excellent. I've read through them all, so I say just fire away. Because I'm sure the talk, I answered some of those questions, it seems, so fire away. You've got great questions. Yeah. Yo. On the road. What's her favorite place? On one What's of these. Favorite place to be outside of the studio. Yeah. Like um, just traveling freely. Yeah. So um, I have a whole thing about motorcycles where if you can't go far, go fast, and if you can't go fast, go far. So like road trips are super dope, um, and then like track days uh, where you can like go around a racetrack or whatever. Uh, I will note, though, that there is a kind of fundamental similarity between the studio and being on the road because, like, the studio is this enclosed space, kind of much like your head is inside of a helmet or whatever. Um, and, it, and, and so, like, it's also, like, the only difference I would say is that in, on, when you have your helmet on, there's, like, a voice in your, in your helmet that just says whatever the hell it wants. Right, and you can't really like control it uh, too much, you know. So like one time I was riding, and it was like all R and B songs from 1988, you know, um, you know, or like one time I was riding, and it was all like everything things that my ex girlfriends have said to me, you know. Um, uh, but like in the studio, you really, you get to say stuff back or whatever, you get to speak back, and so th that's the fundamental distinction. Yeah. Okay, so this is just about your motorcycle. Sure. Philosophy. Yeah. Wouldn't that also mean that if people thought they had to um, not wear a helmet to feel free, that if they were wearing a helmet, then they were no longer free? Yeah, that's 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 what they that's that's the you know that's the kind of if then of that whole. That's what they say. Okay. 
right? Like they say that like, I don't want no nanny state, you know, helmet. Like I want it on my own terms, et cetera, et cetera. Like not really realizing the fundamental interconnectedness of communities and et cetera, right? Like there's no, free, like dude, you're riding on a road that was paved by like, you see what I'm saying? Like the state <laughs> paved your road and you're talking about some freedom from like the state regulation. Like that doesn't make any sense at all. Like, yeah, sorry. Just do it. I mean, it's actually really inexpensive to start. WRIR is right across the street, down a little west. Um, so a women in Radio uh, event this weekend? Yes. Yo, the, uh, hey, no, yeah, the John uh, linked to on the RVA Arts Facebook page. Featuring Kelly um, Libby of Unmonumental, I should say. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, the great thing about radio, Kelly was somebody who helped me when I got started, other people that were at WRR that aren't there anymore. And then, you know, recording equipment is super cheap. And there's a great website uh, that PRX actually kind of runs now called Transom. And they have recommendations for just starting out, get this recorder, this mic, these headphones. One step up, this recorder, this mic, this headphones. And, you know, so there are just a ton of resources out there. And I would just say, do it. I mean, you probably have all of the kind of what I call soft skills, the desire to talk to people and the willingness to do research and call up people and all of that stuff. And the technical part, you can figure it out as you go along. So. Yeah, agreed. All of that. <laughs> so they also um, will work on a, a blog post of concerning this event in conjunction with another thing that they've seen, something I, I would think the BMFA would be in that with this, but um, would you have any recommendations of what they might want to go see this week? Is there anything catching your eye this week, either of you? Um, I think that I would say, like, listen to a new podcast. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I would say. Um, just like, I mean, obviously there's millions of them, you know what I mean? Um, anything in particular? I would, I would say um, have a listen to uh, Love and Radio. Um, Love and Radio is a podcast by uh, the, the magnificent Nick Vanderkoek, who is a Richmonder. Um, but uh, his show is through the Radiotopia network. And he once explained to me the, because everybody has a thing they want to get from their interviewees, you know? So his whole thing was that he wanted to interview people that he wasn't sure about, and that a good interview for him is an interview where he went from not liking the person to kind of liking them to being very ambivalent about them and back again. So like, so like the, the oddest, most compelling interviews, I think, in all of uh, podcasting are on his show. Yeah. Interesting. I have to take a listen, too. And then I would say that there, there is, you know, I mean, there's so much to do in Richmond, as we all know, and so many things to go and see. Um, we mentioned the Viz Arts, the, the, it's a quilt show. So that may sound kind of old and fusty. It's not. It is really amazing. There are um, some of the artists that are, have produced work in that show. Some of them are Richmond based and some of them are nationally and internationally known for um, social activism and um, Hank Willis Thomas, who is really kind of one of, if not the leading social activist artist right now, has a piece in that show. Um, and it's just beautiful. And um, I don't know, I just think I would go down to Broad Street and just walk in the door and check things out. Go with a friend so you won't be scared. <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you all. Thank you.